Section 122 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States, from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Simon Walker. Interview with Simon Walker. Ira S. Jordan. Softly mumbling to himself, and gravely shaking a bare, shiny head that had only a fringe of white, closely kinked, woolly hair about the ears, the old negro shuffled out of the crowded courtroom into the corridor, turning clear, quizzical eyes toward a group of white men loitering near the doorway and addressing no one in particular. With a final emphatic shake of his head, he said, It do beat all, de way dese young niggers is allus in trouble with de law. Now when I was a young buck, de only law amongst us niggers was de word of all massa. Maybe you all's heard tell o' him, Colonel Hugh Walker. If de colonel wasn't de richest man anywhere round Forsyth, Georgie, then my name ain't Simon Walker. Yes, sir, that's my name, too. I belong to de colonel long with more'n a hundred more slaves, and my mammy and pappy before me belong to de Walkers. All of em gone now, gone to glory. And this old nigger here all by hisself, the last one er the family. The colonel, he had eight boys, and all cept the last had shinned the confederates. T'was a terrible sad day when young mass chap was brung home, with one of his legs shot plumb off by the Yankees, and me settin' dar by him a fannin' er way de flies, endurin all the long hot days whilst he was layin' dar on the age o' kingdom come. And all de time I was thinkin' the Lord that my little Mass Jim was too young to go to de war. All de colonel's sons day had body servants, and I was Mass Jim's boy. I used to look after him, go to school with him, and play in de woods till school was out. And if he had er gone to de war, this nigger word had been right dar with him. Nah, sir, Mass Jim and me never did go to war, but I seed the Yankees when General Sherman come marching through our plantation. And of a life for a thousand years, I never forget that day. I ain't never seed so many men in one crowd before or since, and the last one of em wearing the same kind of clothes. They come right up in the yard and a passel em tromped right into the big house, just like it were dern. They turned everything wrong side out, or as a lookin for the silver and the jewelry. But old missus, she done had news that was comin, and all de stuff was hid in the woods. When they couldn't find de plate and jewelry, they was hoppin mad, and at her takin all de hams and rations they could tote off, they set fire to the smoke house and de ban in all de cotton that was piled round the gin house to keep the confederates from getting it they said they took all de good houses and mules and left their old hungry broke down nags that won't fitten for nothing cept fertilize but they didn't hut nobody not even cookie when she tuck her broom out of em in de kitchen i reckon dem soldiers thought de colonel was plumb ruined when they left but I says, Colonel Walker was a rich man, and for long us done brought fresh rations, and drive up de hards from de swamp, and kilt more meat. Then de colonel, he sent off for more mules, and when dey come, de work went on again. Come de day when all de niggers was sot free, Colonel Walker called all de slaves up to de big house, and standin there on de veranda, he told em they was now all free niggers, free to go where they pleased. 
but if anybody wanted to stay on de plantation to hold up their hands, most all de hands stayed on de plantation till de colonel died, and de family sort of broke up. That was four years after de surrender. Well, after dat, I just drifted around and finally landed here in Birmingham in eighteen eighty eight. Want nothing much hair then but muddy roads and swamps. But I got her job totin' mortar where they was buildin de first brick stove, and then er long time afterwards I worked for de T C and I for twenty five years. But de old nigger ain't no more good for hard labor. All de white folks done gone on, and here I is on de welfare, just waitin' for de good Lord to call me up there for de great reunion. Amen. End of section 122. Section 123 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Lucindia Washington. Interview with Lucindia Washington. Alice S. Barton. Little Black Cindy skipped along the narrow path that led to the spring house. In her hand, she swung an empty cedar pail that was soon to fill with cool, fresh milk. She entered the small glade overhung with willow trees and spread with soft grass, and gazed at the sparkling water of the spring as it caught the beams of sunlight coming through the trees and reflected them in myriads of little points. Shadows of waving leaves danced over the ground and up the side of the stone spring house. How cool and nice it was here, she thought. Gentle breezes rustled the limbs of small saplings and quietly stirred the long grass along the upper part of the branch. A young rabbit hopped from a little clump of bushes, and Cindy watched him as the small creature drank thirstily from the crystal water. Occasionally the bunny would lift his head as if warned by a slight sound, but in a moment she saw him fold back his delicate ears and once more dip his small mouth into the babbling water. After quenching his thirst, the rabbit hopped a few feet away and nibbled on a wisp of tender grass. Cindy was as still as a statue as she watched the procedure. That's the cutest little bunny I ever seed, she said to herself. I wish I could catch him. But Cindy knew that she could not catch a rabbit, so she was content to stand in the shadow of a sycamore and gaze eagerly at the animal nibbling the grass. Suddenly, without warning, Cindy's eyes protruded from their sockets with an expression of fear. Slipping noiselessly through the green undergrowth, she saw a giant rattler gliding slowly toward the young rabbit. She wanted to cry out, but she was afraid, afraid of attracting the rattler's attention toward her. She was deathly afraid of snakes. Since babyhood, she had harbored a growing fear of them. If Cindy had been still before this time, she now became a frozen image. It would not have been apparent that she was even breathing. So frightened was she of the snake that her whole body broke out in a profuse perspiration. Her eyes were glued to the tremendous brown monster, which, without the slightest sound, oozed deftly toward its victim. Cindy was hypnotized. The snake seemed to hold her in a strange spell. Slowly, inexorably, he moved entirely out of the undergrowth and was now weaving on the clear ground. He approached the rabbit within a distance of three feet and began to carefully form himself in a deadly coil. Cindy saw every movement. She saw each diamond on its brown back each scale of its crawling skin, each lash and point of its tongue, the whiteness of its breast, the large track that it had made in the sand. She watched its eyes gleam, expressionless and ominous. She gazed at the deadly mouth as it slowly began to open. She was aware of the first appearance of the two death-like fangs pointing downward. She saw the ten-buttoned rattle stand erect, 
She saw it quiver, shake, sound. She saw the rabbit turn with fear. She saw the strike, the sinking of the fangs into the soft brown fur. She watched the rabbit give an ephemeral struggle, witnessed the brief pitiful look in the bunny's eyes, and at last saw the mouth sink into the small belly and draw the last breath of life away. The experience was more than the little girl could stand. Cindy was now in a state of frenzy. She could not move, nor speak, nor turn her eyes. She could only stare. At what? The monstrous snake then girded himself for further onslaught. After being sure his victim was dead, he loosed his grip and stretched at full length upon the ground drew the rabbit out until it, too, was stretched carefully out with its hind feet together and its head pointing in the opposite direction. Then followed an experience that to Cindy seemed entirely impossible. The snake took the hind feet of the rabbit in its mouth until gradually they had disappeared. Then came what seemed to Cindy an agonized struggle. The snake's mouth stretched almost to the breaking point as it began slowly to close over the rest of the rabbit's rear quarter. With fits and starts and jerks and stretches, the rattler reeled and squirmed, contorted and wreathed and sucked until the rabbit had half gone. With the last great effort, the serpent threw himself into another series of bodily contortions that seemed to Cindy positively agonizing to him, until at last... The rabbit had entirely disappeared from the earth. For several minutes, Cindy apparently watched the tremendous hump in the snake move slowly backward. With gradually diminishing intermittent jerks, the snake finally got the small animal to his digestive tract. The monster then crawled to a hot sandy section and went to sleep. Two hours later, it was twilight. An overseer was walking along the path to the spring house. He paused for a moment beneath a sycamore tree to rest and cool himself. As his eyes roamed the shadowy little glade, they came to rest on the body of a little negro girl, lying inert upon the soft grass with the handle of a cedar bucket clutched in a death grip. He lifted the small black form into his arms and carried her to the house. He saw in her face an expression of mingled agony and fear. Yes, yeah, so white folks, that was me. And Cindy smiled as she told me of the experience 80 years later. That was the biggest snake I ever seed. He must have been seven feet long. All this happened in Sumter County where I was born. Us had a pretty place there. I'll never forget how the niggas worked their gardens in the moonlight. There weren't no time in the day. The white folks' work took that time. The overseer rung a big bell for us to get up in the morning at four o'clock, and the first thing we done was to feed the stock. You asked, was we punished? Yes, sir, we was punished for something, most of all for stealing. Yes, sir, we was taught to read and write, but most of the slaves didn't want to learn. Us little niggas would hide our books under the steps to keep from having to study. Us would go to church with the white folks on Sunday and sit in the back. And then we'd go home and eat a big Sunday meal. When we got sick from eating too much of something, Master Jim Godfrey was a doctor and he'd tend to us. Then when new nigga babies came, nine little black bugs was tied up in rags round their necks for to make the baby's teeth easy. When I was married, white folks, at the age of 13, Alex Washington, my husband and me, had a $40 wedding. My mistress baked me a cake and a white schoolmaster named Henry Hidron spoke to ceremony. Me and that old husband had 22 chillins. Yes, ma'am, I sure does believe in ghosties. We's got one good spirit and one bad one. One goes to heaven and the other stays on earth. Ghosties sure does like whiskey, because they'll follow you if and you got any. If and you pour it on the ground beside you, though, They'll lose track of you. Always give a ghost the right-hand side of the road, white folks, and he won't bother you. Yes, my child, I's got religion. I see Jesus a-hanging from the cross. 
he give his blood so that us could live. I knows I's going to heaven. End of section 123「Section 124 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rebecca Eden Walker. Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Eliza White, Interview with Eliza White, Age Around 80, Opelika, Alabama, President Klein, Opelika, Alabama. She seed a haunt. Eliza White lives by the Central of Georgia Railroad Tracks in Opelika. The passing of many years has not dulled her mind, and so she was able to tell of many things which happened before the war. Yassa, I was a slave. Old Massa was named Billy Jones, and old Missus was named Angeline. They lived in Harris County, Georgia, close to Columbus. My pappy and mammy was Peter and Francis Jones, and I had a brother, Dennis, and a sister, Georgianne. Massa was a good man, and I did love old mistis. They was mighty good to us niggers, fed us out of they own garden, we had checked homespun clothes for every day, and purty calico and dyed Osnaburg ones for Sunday. I went to church with the white folks, settin' in the foot of the carriage. I remembers well the Sunday I first seen a shoutin'. It was two white ladies. Massa and Mistis had four children, two of them, Dave and Quit was bad fighting kids. I seen the massa make them strip to their waist and whoop em, then make them go in and bathe. Massa live in a big fine white house. He had two or three hundred slaves, and the quarters was in two long rows running up near about to the big house on the hill. They even raised deer on the place. The houses in the quarters was two-room log houses with a shed room to cook in. My mammy was the cook at the big house, and Granny was the weaver. Pappy was the bed maker. He made most of the beds out in Poplar. I had a little chair in the corner where I sat and kept the flies off and missed us with a green twig brush. Whenever Massa sent any de slaves off in the place, he had to give them passes, so the pad of rollers wouldn't catch em and whip em for running away. The pad of rollers was a good thing for the lazy ones. When daylight come, we had to get up, else we'd be whooped. Massa didn't have his slaves whipped much just when they was lazy and wouldn't work. Every now and then, we would have some good frolics, mostly on Saturday nights. Somebody would play the fiddle, and we all danced to the music. The folks sure had some big times at the corn shuckings, too. The men would work two or three days, hauling the corn and piling it near the crib. Then, they would invite folks from other quarters to come and help with the shucking. While they shucked, they would holler and sing. You jumped and I jumped. Swear by God, you outjumped me. Huh, huh, round the corn, Sally. 
Granny used to give us tea made out in sage roots, mullein, pine, whorehound. That sure was bitter stuff. We had purty beads made with corn. I still remembers the Christmas. I got my first shoes. I just hugged them tight and went to sleep holding them. They was button shoes. When we heard the Yankees was coming, we hid all the meat and rations and the silver in the big swamp and turned the horses loose and all us kids hid in the bed ticks, mattresses. The Yankees stayed around two or three days and would pull the hands out of their beds by their toes. But I really seed a haunt one time. I knowed it was. There was one old man been having the toothache all the time. He used to keep his jaw tied up. I was going over to see him daytime. Well, before I got there, I seed what looked like him coming. When I got nearer, he turned into a man riding a mule and wearing a big hat. Then, before he got to the house, he was plumb gone. That's how I knowed it was a haunt. End of section 124. Section 125 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States From Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1 Alabama Narratives By Various Mingo White Interview with Mingo White Levi D. Shelby, Jr., Tuscumbia, Alabama. Jeff Davis used to camouflage his horse. Mingo White lives at Burleson in Franklin County, Alabama. And though he doesn't know his age, he remembers that he was a big boy when the war between the states began. His reminiscences of slavery days, when he was a field hand, are an incongruous combination of stories of severe cruelty and free Saturday afternoons, Sunday holidays, and happy festivals of corn shucking and community cotton picking. He talks of punishments visited on recalcitrant slaves beyond human endurance, and of tasks saddled on one person that would take half a dozen to accomplish. Mingled with these perhaps fogged memories of the nonagenarian are interesting sidelights of drivers, patter rollers, ku kluxers, and sharecropping in Reconstruction days. I was born in Chester, South Carolina, but I was mostly raised in Alabama, Minko said. When I was about four or five years old, I was loaded in a wagon with a lot more people in it. Where I was bound, I don't know. Whatever become of my mammy and pappy, I don't know for a long time. I was told there was a lot of slave speculators in Chester to buy some slaves for some folks in Alabama. I remember that I was took up on a stand, and a lot of people come round and felt my arms and legs and chest, and asked me a lot of questions. Before we slaves was took to the trading post, old Massa Crawford told us to tell everybody what asked us if we'd ever been sick, to tell him that us had never been sick in our life. Us had to tell him all sorts of lies for our mazza, or else take a beating. I was just a little thing, took away from my mammy and pappy just when I needed them most. The only caring that I had, or ever knowed anything about, was given to me by my friend of my pappy. His name was John White. 
My pappy told him to take care of me for him. John was a fiddler, and many a night I woke up to find myself sleep twixt his legs whilst he was playing for a dance for the white folks. My pappy and mammy were sold from each other, too, the same time as I was sold. I used to wonder if I had any brothers or sisters, as I'd always wanted some. A few years later, I found out I didn't have none. I'll never forget the trip from Chester to Burleson. I wouldn't remember so well, I don't guess, except and I had a big old sheepdog named Trailer. He followed right in back of the wagon that I was in. Us had to cross a wide stream, what I took to be a river. When we started across, old Trailer never stopped following. I was watching him close, so if he gave out, I was going to try to get him. He didn't give out. He didn't even have to swim. He just walked long and lapped the water like a dog will. John took me and kept me in the cabin with him. The cabin didn't have no furniture in it like we has nowadays. The bed was a one-legged. It was made in the corner of the room, with the legs setting out in the middle of the floor. A plank was run twixt the logs of the cabin and nailed to the post on the front of the bed. Across the foot, another plank was run into the logs and nailed to the leg. Then some straw or corn shucks was piled on for a mattress. Us used anything what we could get for a cover. The table had two legs, the legs set out the front, whilst the back part was nailed to the wall. Us didn't have no stove. There was a great big fireplace where the cooking was done. Us didn't have to cook, though, less than us got hungry after supper been served at the house. I weren't nothing but a child enduring slavery. But I had to work the same as any man. I went to the field and hosed cotton, pulled fodder and picked cotton with the rest of the hands. I kept up, too, to keep from getting any lashes that night when us got home. In the winter, I went to the woods with the men folks to help get wood or to get sap from the trees to make turpentine and tar. If us didn't do that, we made charcoal to run the blacksmith shop with. The white folks was hard on us. They would whoop us about the least little thing. It wouldn't have been so bad if in us had a had comforts. But to live like us did was enough to make anybody soon as be dead. The white folks told us that us born to work for them and that us was doing fine at that. The next time that I saw my mammy, I was a great big boy. There was a woman on the place where everybody called mammy, Selena White. One day, Mammy called me and said, Mingo, your Mammy is coming. I said, I thought that you was my Mammy. She said, No, I ain't your Mammy. Your Mammy is way away from here. I couldn't believe that I had another Mammy, and I never thought about it any more. One day, I was sitting down at the barn when a wagon come up the lane. I stood round like a child will. When the wagon got to the house, my mammy got out and broke and run to me and throwed her arms round my neck and hugged and kissed me. I never even put my arms round her or nothing of the sort. I just stood there looking at her. She said, Son, ain't you glad to see your mammy? I looked at her and walked off. Mammy Selina called me and told me that I had hurt my mammy's feelings and that this woman was my mammy. I went off and studied and I begins to remember things. I went to Selena and asked her how long it had been since I seen my mammy. She told me that I had been away from her since I was just a little child. I went to my mammy and told her that I was sorry I'd done what I did and that I would like for her to forget and forgive me for the way I act when I first saw her. After I had talked with my real mammy, she told me of how the family had been broke up and that she hadn't seen my pappy since he was sold. My mammy never would have seen me no more if the Lord hadn't have been in the plan. Tom White's daughter married one of Mr. Crawford's sons. They lived in Virginia. Back then, it was the custom for women to come home whenever their husband died or quit him. Mr. Crawford's son died, and that throwed her to have to come home. My mammy had been her maid, so when she got ready to come home, she brung my mammy with her. It was hard back in them days. 
Every morning before daybreak, you had to be up and ready to get to the field. It was the same every day in the year, except on Sunday, and then we was getting up earlier than folks do now, on Monday. The drivers was hard to. They would say whatever they wanted to, and you couldn't say nothing for yourself. Somehow, or other, us had an instinct that we was going to be free. In the event when the day's work was done, the slaves would be found locked in their cabins, praying for the Lord to free them like he did the children of Israel. If and they didn't lock up, the Maza or the driver would have heard them and whooped them. The slaves had a way of putting a wash pot in the door of the cabin to keep the sound in the house. I remember once old Ned White was caught praying. The drivers took him the next day and carried him to the pegs, but was four stakes drove in the ground. Ned was made to pull off everything but his pants and lay on his stomach between the pegs while somebody strapped his legs and arms to the pegs. Then they walked him toward the blood run from him like he was a hog. They made all of the hands come and see it, and they said us would get the same thing if us was caught. They don't allow a man to whoop a horse like they whooped us in them days. After my mammy come where I was, I helped her with her work. Her task was too hard for any one person. She had to serve as maid to Mr. White's daughter, cook for all of the hands, spin and card four cuts of thread a day, and then wash. There was 144 threads to the cut. If she didn't get all of this done, she got 50 lashes that night. Many a night, me and her would spin and card so she could get her task the next day. No matter what she had to do the next day, she would have to get them four cuts of thread even on wash day. Wash day was on Wednesday. My mammy would have to take the clothes about three quarters of a mile to the branch where the washing was to be done. She didn't have no washboard like they have nowadays. She had a paddle what she beat the clothes with. Everybody knowed when wash day was because they could hear the paddle for about three or four miles. Pow, pow, pow. That's how it sounds. She had to iron the clothes the same day that she washed and then get them four cuts of thread. Lots of times she failed to get them and got the fifty lashes. One day when Tom White was whooping her, she said, Lay it on, Massa White, because I'm going to tell the Yankees when they come. When Mammy got through spinning the cloth, she had to dye it. She used shamak berries, indigo, bark from some trees, and there was some kind of rock, probably iron ore, but she got red dye from. The clothes wouldn't fade neither. The white folks didn't learn us to do nothing but work. They said that us weren't supposed to know how to read and write. There was one fella named E.C. White what learned to read and write and during slavery. He had to carry the children books to school for him and go back at him. His young master taught him to read and write unbeknownst to his father and the rest of the slaves. Us didn't have nowhere to go except church, and we didn't get no pleasure out in it because we weren't allowed to talk from the time we left home till us got back. If us went to church, the drivers went with us. Us didn't have no church except the white folks' church. After old Ned got such a terrible beating for praying for freedom, he slipped off and went to the north to join the Union Army. After he got into army, he wrote to Massa Tom. In his letter, he had those words. I am laying down, Massa, and getting up, Massa. Meaning that he went to bed when he felt like it, and got up when he pleased to. He told Tom White that if and he wanted him, he was in the army, and that he could come after him. After old Ned had got to the north, the other hands began to watch for a chance to slip off. Many a one was cautious and brung back. They knowed the penalty what they would have to pay, and this caused some of them to get desperate. To rather than to take a beating, they would choose to fight it out till they was able to get away, or die before they would take the beating. Lots of time when the paddy rollers would get after the slaves, they would have the worst fight, and sometimes the paddy rollers would get killed. After the war, I saw Ned, and he told me the night he left, the paddy rollers run him for four days. He say the way he did to keep them from catching him was he went by the woods. 
the paddy rollers came into woods looking for him, so we just got a tree on him and then followed. They figured that he was heading for the free stays, so they headed that way too, and Ned just followed them for as they could go. Then he climbed a tree, and his while they turned round and come back. Ned went on without any trouble much. The paddy rollers used to be bad. They would run to folks if they was caught out after 8 o'clock in the night, if they didn't have no pass from the Mazza. After the day's work was done, there weren't nothing for the slaves to do but go to bed. Wednesday night, they went to prayer meeting. We had to be in the bed by 9 o'clock. Every night, the drivers come round to make sure that we was in the bed. I heard tell the folks going to bed and then getting up and going to the other plantation. On Saturday, the hands worked till noon. They had the rest of the time to work their gardens. Every family had a garden of their own. On Saturday nights, the slaves could frolic for a while. They would have parties sometimes and whiskey and homebrew for the servants. On Sundays, we didn't do anything but lay around and sleep, because we didn't like to go to church. On Christmas, we didn't have to do no work. No more on feed the stock and do the little work around the house. When we got through with that, we had the rest of the day to run round wherever we wanted to go. Of course, we had to get permission from the Mazza. The owners of slaves used to give corn shucking parties and invite slaves from the other plantations. They would have plenty of whiskey and other stuff to eat. The slaves would shuck corn and eat and drink. They used to give cotton pickings the same way. All of this went on at night. They had jack lights in the cotton patch for us to see by. The lights was made on a fork stick and moved from place to place whilst we picked. The corn shucking was done at the barn, and they didn't have to have the lights so they could move them from place to place. The only games that I played when I was young was marbles and ball. I used to sing a few songs that I heard the older folks sing like. Sissy's ladies think they mighty grand. Sitting at the table, coffee pot of rye. Oh, you rebel union band, have these ladies understand. We leave our country to meet you, Uncle Sam. These songs was about the soldiers and the war. There was one about old General Wise what went. Old General Wise was a mighty man, and not a wise man either. It took forty yards of cloth to make a uniform to march into happy land of Canaan. Chorus, ha ha, ha ha, the south light is coming. Charge, boys, charge, this battle we must have to march us in the happy land of Canaan. There was a song about General Roddy, too. Run old Roddy through Tuscambia, through Tuscambia, we go marching on. Chorus, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go marching on. O Roddy's coat was flying, O Roddy's coat flying high, till it almost touched the sky. We go marching on. I was a pretty big boy when the war broke out. I remember seeing the Yankees cross Big Bear Creek Bridge one day. All of the soldiers crossed the bridge but one. He stayed on the other side where all the rest had got crossed. Then he got down off in his horse and took a bottle of something in and strode it all over the bridge. Then he lighted a match to it and followed the rest. In a few minutes, the rebel soldiers come to the bridge to cross, but it was on fire and they had to swim cross to the other side. I went home and told my mommy that the rebels was chasing the Union soldiers and that one of the Unions had poured some water on the bridge and started a fire. She laugh and say, Son, don't you know that water don't make a fire? That must have been turpentine or oil. I remember one day Mr. Tom was having a big barbecue for the rebel soldiers in our yard. Come a big roaring down the military road, and three men in blue coats rode up to the gate and come on in. Just as soon as the rebels saw him, they all run to the woods. In about five minutes, the yard was full of blue coats. They eat up all the grub what the rebels had been eating. Tom White had to run away to keep the Yankees from getting him. 
Before the Yankees come, the white folks took all their clothes and hung them in the cabins. They told the color folks to tell the Yankees that the clothes were there. They told us to tell them how good they'd been to us and that we'd like to live with them. All that day, we got news that we was free. Mr. White called us niggas to the house. He said, You are all free, just as free as I am. Now go and get yourselves somewhere to stick your heads. Just as soon as he say that, my mammy hollered out, That's enough for a yearling. She struck out across the field to Mr. Lee Osborne's to get a place for me and her to stay. He paid us 75 cents a day, 50 cents to her, and two bits for me. He gave us our dinner along with the wages. After the crop was gathered for that year, me and my mammy cut and hauled wood for Mr. Osborne. Us left Mr. Osborne that fall and went to Mr. John Rawlins. Us made a share crop with him. Us had picked two rows of cotton, and he'd picked two rows. Us had pulled two rows of corn, and he'd pulled two rows. He furnished us with rations and a place to stay. Us had sell our cotton and open corn and pay Mr. John Rawlins for feeding us. Then we moved with Mr. Hugh Nelson and made a share crop with him. We keep moving and making share crops till us saved up enough money to rent us a place and make a crop for ourselves. Us did right well at this until the Ku Klux got so bad. Us had to move back with Mr. Nelson for protection. The men that took us in was Union men. They lived here in the South, but they took in us part in the slave business. The Ku Klux threatened to whoop Mr. Nelson because he'd take up for the niggers. Heap of nights we would hear of the Ku Klux coming and leave home. Sometimes us was scared not to go and scared to go away from home. One day I borrowed a gun from Ed Davis to go squirrel hunting. When I'd taken the gun back, I didn't unload it like I always been doing. That night, the Ku Klux called on Ed to whoop him. When they told him to open the door, he heard one of them say, Shoot him time he gets the door open. Well, he says to him, Wait till I can light the lamp. Then he got the gun what I had left loaded, got down on his knees, and stuck it through a log and pulled the trigger. He hit Newt Dobbins in the stomach and killed him. He couldn't stay around Burleson anymore, so he come to Mr. Nelson and got enough money to get to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. The Ku Klux got bad show enough then and went to killing niggers and white folks too. I married Kizzy Drumgool. Reverend W.C. Northcross performed a ceremony. There weren't nobody there but the witness and me and Kizzy. I had three sons, but all of them is dead, except in one, and that's Hugh. He got seven childrens. He works on the relief. Abe Lincoln was as noble a man as ever walked. Jeff Davis was as smart man as you ever want to see. And during the war, he sheared his horse in such a way that he looked like he was going one way when he'd go into the other. Booker T. Washington did one of the greatest things when he fixed it for nigger boys and girls to learn how to get on in the world. Slavery wouldn't have been so bad, but folks made it so by selling us for high prices, and of course, folks had to try to get their money's worth out of them. The children of Israel was in bondage one time, and God sent Moses to deliver them. Well, I suppose that God sent Abe Lincoln to deliver us. End of section 125, read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 16th, 2023. Section 126 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves, volume one, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various. Abe Whitus Interview with Abe Whitus 
David Holt, Mayor of Douglasville. When the sunshine is warm, Abe Whitus, Mayor of Douglasville, sits outside his cabin door near Bay Minette, Alabama, and watches the stream of traffic on US 31 just beyond his bare feet, a resting in the soothing sand. More than 90 years ago, he was born not many miles from the same cabin over in Mississippi as a slave of Colonel Rupert, who owned plantations in Alabama and Mississippi. I come over to Alabama after the surrender, Abe Whitus told his interviewer, after he had retired with dignity to put on shoes before he permitted his photograph to be taken. I went to a plantation in Butler County first, and then came on down here to Bay Minette. Slavery wasn't so bad. Colonel Rupert was a good master, but he lived way over in Mobile, and us was at his Scooby, Scuba, plantation. That was in Kemper County, and his overseer there sure was handy with a whoop. I was a cotton hand, and spent most of my time toting water for the other hands. When Mr. Lincoln emancipated us, we was free, and I didn't carry any more water. It wasn't twelve after the surrender I went to Butler County, where Colonel Rupert had him another plantation. I come down here to Bay Minette a long time ago. I asked to be chairman of the Republican Party in Baldwin County here. But when the Republicans got in, they made the white gentleman what took my job postmaster. Then the bank I had my money in went busted in another Republican time and I loses $658.05. I vote for Mr. Roosevelt now. Abe Whitus stopped to take a chew of his favorite tobacco and admitted that he lived alone in his one-room cabin by preference. He doesn't want any women bothering around his place and ain't had no trucking with him for years. He cooks on the hearth just as his mammy did before him decades ago in the slave corners of Colonel Rupert's plantation. Despite his years, he is well able to take care of himself. He carries his nine decades lightly, and his kindly face is topped by a wealth of snow-white hair. Though he lost money in the bank failure that made him a Democrat in politics, Abe owns 14 acres of land, part of which he farms. He has cleared a portion of it for a baseball diamond which is rented to Negro teams, who play there frequently. The fee is always collected before a ball is thrown. Several years ago, he donated a part of the acreage to be used for a public road, which opened up a portion of Douglasville, the suburb in which he lives, where a number of Negroes had developed a residential section. His people named him then and since Mayor of Douglasville, without office or emolument, but Abe wears the title with a dignified content for his remaining years. End of section 126. Read by David Only, Portland, Oregon, January 4th, 2023. Section 127 of Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1. Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Slave Narratives, a folk history of slavery in the United States from interviews with former slaves. Volume 1, Alabama Narratives, by Various. Callie Williams. Interview with Callie Williams. Mary A. Poole, Mobile. Paddle rollers used shackles, says Callie. Callie Williams was only four years old at the time of the surrender, but stories told to her by her mother are vividly remembered, and the fact that she has had the same environment continuously throughout the years imprinted these happenings permanently on her mind. She lives at 504 Eslava Street, Mobile. My mammy and pappy was brought to Alabama by speculators who sold him to Mr. Hiram McLemore at Newport Landing on the Alabama River, Callie said. Mammy's name was Vicey, and she was born in Virginia. But my pappy was born in Kentucky. His name was Harry. Mr. McLemore had about 300 head of slaves. 
some of them on one plantation of about 2,000 acres and the rest on another place of about 500 acres. He sure did have a pretty house. It was all white and rambling-like and had big trees around it. There was a cool well and a big dairy right close by it, and then the cabins was all in a row in the back, some of them made of planks, but most of them made with logs. They was all named after whoever lived in them. Aunt Callie needed little urging to tell of the old days, and she claims to vividly remember her master's family. His wife was named Axie Bathia, and he had seven children, she said. One of them I never will forget, Miss Julia, because she gave me the first calico dress I ever had, and I was proud as a peacock with it. Miss Julia was the oldest little girl, and they give me to her. My mammy say they waked up in the morning when they heard the sweep. That was a piece of iron hanging by a string, and it made a loud noise when it was banged with another piece of iron. They had to get up at four o'clock and be at work by sunup. To do this, they most all the time cooked breakfast the night before. Pappy was a driver under the overseer, but Mammy said that she stayed at the little nursery cabin and looked after all the little babies. They had a cabin fixed up with homemade cradles and things where they put all the babies. Their mammies would come in from the field about 10 o'clock to nurse them, and then later in the day, my mammy would feed the youngest on pot liquor and the older ones on greens and pot liquor. They had skimmed milk and mush too, and all of them stayed as fat as a butter balls, me among them. Mammy saw that I always got my share. The slaves got rations every Monday night. There would be three pounds of meat and a peck of meal. There was a big garden that all of them worked, and they all had the vegetables they needed, and there was always plenty of skimmed milk. They cooked the meals on open fireplaces and the big iron spiders. Then was big pots hanging over the fire from a hook. They do the cooking at night and then warm it over the next day if they wanted it that way. While Mammy was tending the baby, she had to spin cotton, and she was supposed to spin two cuts a day. Four cuts was a hard day's work. What was a cut? You ought to know that. They had a reel, and when it had spun 300 yards, it popped. That was a cut. When it had been spun, then another woman took it to the loom to make cloth for the slaves. They always took Saturday afternoon to clean up the clothes and cabins, because they always had to start work on Monday morning clean as a pin. If they didn't, they got whooped for being dirty. Some of the niggas, after they'd been beat, would try to run away, and some of them got loose but the patter rollers caught a lot of them and then they'd get it harder than ever before and have shackles out on their feet with just enough slack for them to walk so they could work. If they wanted to go possum hunting or fishing, they could get passes from the overseer. Two things they really loved to eat was possum and fish. They'd eat and eat till they'd get sick and then they'd have to boil up a dose of bone set tea to work them out. If that didn't make them feel better, they'd go to Marster. He always kept calomel, blue mass, and quinine on hand. If they got too bad off sick, then Master would call the doctor. The children wasn't bothered with nothing much but worms, and they'd take Jerusalem oak. It was the seed of a weed that cook and mix lasses to make it taste like candy. Boneset was a bush, and they'd boil the leaves to get boneset tea. Most of the time, slaves would be too tired to do anything but go to bed at night but sometimes they would sit around and sing after supper, and they would sing and pray on Sunday. One of the songs that was used most was Young Comes Old Master Jesus. If I remembers it rightly, it went something like this. I really believe Christ is coming again. He's coming in the morning. He's coming in the morning. He's coming with a rainbow on his shoulder. He's coming again by and by. They tried to make them stop singing and praying during the war because all they'd ask for was to be set free. But the slaves would get in the cabins and turn a big wash pot upside down and sing into that and the noise couldn't get out. I don't remember nothing about this except what my mammy say. When the surrender come, 
she say that a whole regiment of soldiers rode up to the house yelling to the niggas that they was free. Then the soldiers took the meat out of the smokehouse and got all the lasses and meal and give it to all the niggas. They robbed the bees and then they eat dinner and go on to the next place, taking the men folks with them, all excepting the ones too old, my pappy among them. After it was all over, my pappy rented land on Mr. McLemore's place and he and Mammy stayed there till they died. They was buried in the same graveyard that Mr. McLemore had set aside for his slaves. I married Frank Williams in Montgomery, Alabama, but our marriage was nothing like Mammy say her and Pappy's was. She say they jumped a broomstick. When any of the slaves wanted to get married, they would go to the big house and tear master, and he'd get his broomstick and say, Harry, does you want vicey? And Harry would say, yes. Then Master would say, Vicey, do you want Harry? And she would say, Yes. Then Master would say, Join hands and jump the broomstick and you was married. The ceremony wasn't much, but they stuck lots closer then, and you didn't hear about so many divorces and such as that. All my children is dead but two. I had five. One is living in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I live here with the other one. I specs I'll just go on living here till I die, serving old master the best I can. If all the peoples on this here earth would do that, we wouldn't be pestered with all these here troubles like we is nowadays. End of section 127. Section 128 of Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rebecca Eden Walker. Slave Narratives a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various Sylvia Witherspoon Interview with Sylvia Witherspoon Susie R. O'Brien Uniontown, Alabama Boots gets tired from chopping cotton Aunt Sylvia Witherspoon sat dozing on the steps of her small cabin, her bare feet stretched out in the dry dust of the yard. A large horsefly settled upon her broad nose, and after a moment Aunt Sylvia's composure was disturbed to such an extent that she waved it off with her hand. On doing so, her eyes opened, and she saw me approaching the steps. She straightened. Moanin', mistis! Just settin' here, coolin' off my foots. I's plumb wore out from choppin' cotton. Yes, ma'am, she continued, after I asked a few questions. I remember some things about the slavery days, cause I can't remember just exactly how old I is. But I must be mart nigh on to ninety, cause I was a right sizable gal when the war ended. I was born on a plantation in Jackson, Mississippi, that belonged to my massa, Dr. Minta Witherspoon. My pappy and mammy was named Lum and Phyllis Witherspoon. The white folks lived in a big white house made out in logs. Honey, massa and mistress Witherspoon was quality. Yes, ma'am, they was quality. Us slaves was treated like we was something round that place. Master didn't allow no overseer to tote no strap on his niggers. Besides that, we was fed good and had good clothes. He used to done head brogan sent out in boxfuls from Mobile. My job was to do little things round a white folks' house, but before that, I stayed in the quarters and nursed my mammy's chillin while she worked in the fields. She would tie the smallest baby on my back so's I could play without no inconvenience. 
I like to stay at the big house, though, and fan the flies off into white folks while they et. That was the best job I ever had. Mistis give me a dress that the white chillins done outgrowed, and on Sunday I was the dressed upest nigger in the quarter. Massa longed to the Presbyterian church, so all us niggers was Presbyterians too. We all went to our own church that was on the place dar. Massa kept a pack of bloodhounds, but it warn't often that he had to use em, cause a none of our niggers ever runned away. One day, though, a nigger named Joe did run away. Believe me, mistis, them bloodhounds caught that nigger fore he even got to the creek. Makes me laugh till yet the way that nigger jumped in the creek when he couldn't swim a lick just cause of them hounds was after him. He sure made a splash, but they managed to get him out fore he drowned. I married about a year after the war, and mistis, I didn't have no pretty dress to get married in. I married that old nigger in a dirty work dress, and my feet was bare, just like they is now. I figured that if and he loved me, he loved me just as well in my bare feet as he would with my shoes on. Does I believe in ghosties? Sure I does. I don't suppose you was born with a veil on your face like I was, cause I can see them ghosties as plain as they was here right now. I'll tell you about one that comes out the white folks' churchyard. On dark rainy nights, I sees him tall, with long white robes drapping from him. He carries a big light so bright that you can't see his face, but he looks just like a man. It don't bother me none, cause I don't bother it. I keeps a flower sifter and a fork by my bed to keep the witches from riding me. How come I know stays ride me? Honey, I be so tired in the morning, I can scarcely get out in my bed and it's all on account of them witches riding me. So I put the sifter there to catch em. Sometimes I wear this dime with a hole in it round my ankle to keep off the conjure. But since Monroe King took and died, us ain't had much conjuring round here. You know, that old nigger would put a conjure on somebody for just a little sum of money. He sold conjure bags to keep the sickness away. He could conjure the grass and the birds and anything he wanted to. The niggers around used to give him chickens and things so he wouldn't conjure them. But it's a funny thing, mistress. I ain't never understood it. He got took off to jail for stealing a mule, and us niggers waited round many a day for him to conjure hisself out. But he never did. I guess he just didn't have quite enough conjuring material to get hisself through that stone wall. I ain't never understood it, though. End of section 128Section 129 of Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Slave Narratives, A Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves, Volume 1, Alabama Narratives by Various George Young Interview with George Young, Ruby Pickens Tart, Livingston, Alabama Peter had no keys, seven hisn. The Lord wouldn't trusted Peter with no keys to heaven. 
in the opinion of George Young of Livingston, Alabama, born into slavery ninety-one years ago. George knew the rigors of slavery under the absentee landlord and brutal overseers, according to the story he tells. I was born on what was known as the Chapman Place, five miles northwest of Livingston, on August tenth, 1846. George began his tale. My name was George Chapman, and I had five brothers, Anderson, Harrison, William, Henry, and Sam, and three sisters, Phoebe, Frances, and Amelia. My mother's name was Mary Ann Chapman, and my father's name was Sam Young. He belonged to Mr. Chapman. Us all belonged to Governor Reuben Chapman of Alabama. The overseer's name was Mr. John Smith, and another's name was Mr. Lawler. He was dared the year I was born, and they called it Lawler Year. Both of em was mean, but Lawler, I hear tell, was the meanest. They had over three hundred slaves, cause they had three plantations, one at Bodke, one in Huntsville, and this year one. I can't say Marcia Chapman wasn't good to us, cause he was all the time in Huntsville, and just come now and then and bring his family to see Boughton things. But the overseers was so mean. I seed slaves plenty times with iron bands round their ankles, and a hole in the band, and an iron rod fast to hit, what went up the outside of their leg and their waist, and fastened to another iron band round the waist. This year was to keep em from bending their legs and running away. They call it putting the stiff knee on you, and hit sure made em stiff. Sometimes it made em sick, too, cause they'd had them iron bands so tight round the ankles that when they tuck em off, live things was under em, and that's what give em fever, they say. Us had to go out in the woods and get mayapple root and mullenweed and all such to bow for to cure the fever. Miss, uh, why was the Lord in them days? What was he doin? But some of em runned away anyhow. My brother Harrison was one, and they sat the nigger dogs on him like a fox hounds run a fox today. They didn't run him down till about night, but finally they cotched him, and the hunters fetched him, and to do day and say, Mary Ann, here Harrison. Then they turned the dogs loose on him again, and such a screamin' you never heard. He was all bloody, and Mammy was a hollerin', Save him, Lord, save my child, and don't let them dogs eat him up. Mr. Lawler said, De Lord ain't got nothin' to do with this here, and hit sho sure look like he didn't, cause them dogs nigh bout chewed Harrison up. Dem was hard time, sho. Sure. They didn't larn us nothin', and didn't allow us to larn nothin'. If and they catch us larnin' to read and write, they cut us hen off. They didn't allow us to go to church, neither. Sometimes us slip off and have a little prayer meeting by us cells, in an old house with a dirt flow. They'd get happy and shout, and couldn't nobody hear em, cause they didn't make no fuss on the dirt flow, and one stand in the door and watch. Some folks put their head in the wash pot to pray, and pray easy, and somebody be watching for the overseer. Us get whooped for everything if an hit was public knowed. Us wasn't allowed to visit nobody from place to place, and I seed Jim Dawson, dis here same Iverson Dawson's daddy. I seed him stobbed out with four stobs. They laid him down on his belly and stretch his hands out on both sides and tie one to one stob and one to the other. Both his feet was stretched out and tied to them stobs. Then they whooped him with a whole board, what you cover a house with. The darkies had to go dare in the night and take him up in a sheet and carried him home. But he didn't die. He was accused of going over to the neighbor's plantation at night. Nine o'clock was the last hour us had to be closed in. Head man come out and holler, Oh, yes, oh, yes, everybody in and doors locked. And if and you won't, you got whooped. Won't a nobody loud to coat. Us just taken up together and go ahead, and that thing won't fix twill after surrender. The petroleums come from different places, and the Tanksleys, the Potts, the Cockles, and the Gregories was neighbors. 
i may have went to de house and dey claim to protect me playing wid de little nigger children but if in de patrollers catch me dey claim dey wasn't sponsible one day dey tuck out atter me and i come right here in livingston but i was gwine to run away anyhow cause i had seed old uncle thornton dat mornin'. see i was de calf nusser and soon as i left de house i met him and here come de overseer mr smith he sent atter me and said i seed six niggers in de woods what run away and asked did i see old man thornton i said no i ain't seed nobody he said nev mind i make you tell a better tell than dat in de mornin so when i went with the slop to dem caves i got to thinkin bout dat whoopin so i came right here mr norville had a wood shop right cross de road there by de white folks baptist church and i hid in de back of it at dat night but they found me and tuck me back then they stopped me from kafnessin and put me in the field under the head man i was glad at dat cause i wanted to be with the other hands but when i found out how twas i wanted to be back it was harder tes then when i was nussin calves and keep em from breakin in the field and eatin up de crop i was a good hand and obeyed de owners and de head man and never had no fuss about work i went one time to bennett's station ten miles below here with just seven more niggers from de chapman place and us drivin over a thousand head of cattle to atlanta georgia and never had no trouble i was easy pleased give me a piece of candy and i'd lick it twelve my mouth was so i reckon it was all right but i dunno all the nations couldn't rule just like it is now the strongest people must rule at their surrender they tuck a darkie for the probate judge and that nigger didn't know nothin and he couldn't rule so den they tuck a white man named sanders and he done all right he was under hard taskmasters and i'm glad they sought me free cuz i was under burden and bound but ignorancy can't rule hit sure can't we as darkies and white folks ought to be favorable some speaks better words than others but everybody ain't got the same heart and dat's all i knows no m i don't know nothin bout no spirits either but christ peered to the apostles and didn't he atter be been dead and i seed folks done been dead just as natural as they day as you is now one day me and my wife was pickin cotton right out yonder on mr white's place and i looked up and seed a man all dressed in black with a white shirt bosom his hat a sittin on one side ridin a black hoss i stooped down to pick some cotton didn't look up and he was gone i said to my wife i call her glover but she go by two names i said glover wonder where dat man went what was riding long yonder on dat pacin hoss she say what pacin hoss and what man i said he was comin down dat bank by dat ditch dey ain't no bridge dere and no hoss could jump it glover said well i'm gwine in de house cause i don't feel like pickin cotton today. but i ain't scared of em i gets out de path plenty time to let em by and if en you can see em you walk round em if en you can't see em then dey'll walk round you if en dey gets too plentiful i just hangs a hoss you upside down over de door and don't have no more trouble but everybody oughter have dat kinder mind to honor god he peered to de disciples and he said also peter i'll give you de keys to de kingdom but peter didn't have nobody's keys cepin hisn don't you know if en he'd have give peter all dem keys dey's a heap of folks peter gwinter keep out of dere just for spite god ain't gwinter do nothin dat foolish peter didn't have nobody's keys cepin peter's end of section one hundred twenty nine in the slave narratives a folk history of slavery in the united states from interviews with former slaves volume one alabama narratives by various